Not... Okay, so now you can see the result from the poll. Okay, awesome. Okay, the floor is yours. Go ahead, Frank. Nancy, the slides, please. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today and thank you for kicking off with the, with the poll. I uh, appreciate it. Um, thank you for everyone for making time to join us today. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Frank Aswani. I'm the CEO of African Venture Philanthropy Alliance. Uh, this is part of the series under IVPC um, in which we are hosting different uh, COVID-related uh, sessions from across the world. Uh, this week is Africa's turn, and we're very proud to have two uh, organizations to share with us some of the stuff they're doing in response to the COVID uh, challenge on the continent. Uh, just to remind all of you that we shall be, uh, you shall remain muted uh, during the course of the, of the, of the webinar. Um, please, for any questions and answers, use the questions tab. Uh, it's, you'll see it on the side of, uh, of your screen, and we'll be taking questions uh, at the end after the two speakers have spoken. Uh, and you'll have another poll between the speakers, so to keep you engaged and for us to get a bit more information about where, where, where you're, you're you know, on, on the poll. And just to remind everyone that this is being recorded, um, so uh, please take note of that. But happy to have you on, on board. Uh, as you know, AVPA is part of a sister network of um, international partners that includes um, the European Venture Philanthropy uh, Association, EVPA, and the Asian uh, network, which is EVP, AVPN. Uh, we're proud to be having this session to talk about what's happening in Africa. We've luckily been um, uh, very, I'd say, relatively spared uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. We haven't been as affected on, on the continent. If you use things like hospitalization as a measure, we haven't been that hit on the continent yet, uh, but it's still too early to say that. Um, for those of you who don't know, AVPA is a Pan-African network that brings together social investors, um, we are looking to uh, try and solve Africa's social challenges through the collaboration of investors along the whole continuum of capital, but also those who are offering human intellectual capital as well. As part of the COVID-19 response, we've, we've built in uh, and created communities of response in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. We have about 350 uh, organizations, investors, and uh, implementers on the platform. And part of what you're going to hear today is, is two of our of our partners uh, presenting. I won't uh, take time to go through their bios and memos. They're all part of the invitation you received because I think it's more interesting for you to hear them out. So straight away, first of all, we'll have Angela from Ushahidi um, who will speak first, and then Andrew, who's uh, part of uh, leading Safe Hands Kenya, will go next. So um, next slide to welcome Angela, um, please, who will get started uh, and keep us uh, going. Thank you very much. And I'll catch up with you again when we come to the Q&A session. Please put in your question and answers in this in the section uh, on, on the other um, the, the title questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank, and thank you for for having me today. Thank you to the African Venture Philanthropy Alliance for inviting me to speak on today's webinar. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes running you through a brief historical background into who we are as Ushahidi and how our tools, or rather how the tools we are building are supporting communities around the world to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Next slide. Ushahidi is a Swahili word that means testimony. The Kenyan elections in 2007 were marked by really high tribal tensions. So of course, when results were announced, they were largely contested, resulting in the breakout of violence across the country. Next slide. A lot of what was happening on the ground was largely underreported or not reported at all. So a group of five Kenyan bloggers came together to help ordinary Kenyans shed light into what was happening around them. They built a platform where people could text in or fill out a web form and have that information aggregated on a map. What you're seeing on the screen right now is actually a snapshot of the very first Ushahidi deployment. So, you know, essentially it gave Kenyans a voice when no one else could or would. Next slide. So who are we? Ushahidi is a global non-profit technology company that aims to provide equal access to tech, information and skills for people to effectively solve problems in their communities. We build open source software um, as well as use it to facilitate large scale data collection, 
organization and analysis to inform decision making. The goal here is to really help marginalized groups to participate in solving problems in the communities and to also help the organizations that serve them to listen and respond better. Um, next slide. Over the last 12 years of our existence, our tools have been used across multiple sectors of social impact, such as crisis response, transparency and accountability, human rights and advocacy, amongst others that you're able to see on your screen now. From assisting in relief efforts after the earthquakes in Haiti and Nepal, to fighting forest fires in Russia, or helping citizens take control of the election processes in the US, Kenya and Nigeria, um, to reporting corruption scandals in Indonesia. Ushahidi has become a key tool used for individuals and activists, large development organizations, as well as grassroots organizations in the front lines in the world over. Next slide. Our tools have been deployed more than 200,000 times in more than 160 countries, crowdsourcing more than 50 million reports from citizens across the world. Next slide. And the beautiful thing about this is that this is a tool that was built in Africa, a tool that you always tend to associate with problems in Africa, such as low bandwidth and bad governance. We've seen exponential growth in use of the platform because we've used a mobile first approach to building our tools. Um, and we've also made sure that our tools meet our audiences where they are. Our philosophy is that if it works in Africa, it'll work everywhere. <laughs> We've also made a deliberate, we've deliberately made the platform open source to make sure that it is accessible to anyone anywhere in the world and lower those barriers of use into um, lowering the barriers of use to technology. So let's move on to, you know, the topic of the day, which is, you know, how we are responding to COVID-19. Next slide. This pandemic has wrecked havoc at an unprecedented scale, with requests coming in from nearly every country in the world simultaneously. In the last month, there has been growing need for platforms to surface additional information, as well as support coordination efforts. Next slide. And the way we've tried to respond or the way we are trying to support groups that are working around this crisis is by one, we've waived the fees on our hosted service in a bit, in a bit to make the tool more accessible to those in need. Um, what we've seen is our team is actually busier than ever. We've been spending hours on calls with deployers, helping them get set up and customize their maps, as well as making sure that our technology and our servers are stable. We've been building um, features that are urgently required, but also most importantly, trying to amplify the work within our networks and connect people to each other to prevent duplication of efforts. Next slide. As of 27th April, 2020, there have been more than 520 COVID-related deployments of the Ushahidi platforms. We are seeing communities self-organizing to provide mutual aid, to document COVID-19 testing experiences, as well as create visibility on where to access essential resources. Um, from the graphs that you're seeing here, Europe and Africa are taking up nearly half of the number of deployments um, of Ushahidi, followed closely by South America and North America. Um, I'd then like to I'd like to now jump into a few notable examples to dive deeper into some of the work that each of them um, are doing. Next slide. Frana la curva. Um, which is uh, Spanish for flatten the curve, is a citizen-driven initiative that started thanks to institutional and governmental support, and it then quickly evolved into a grassroots project aimed at helping people to cope with the crisis and the lockdown in Spain. Their goal is to provide useful online resources as well as map public services around citizens. Their Spanish deployment so far has managed to gather more than 9,000 reports in just one month. Next slide. They have spurred a movement in the Hispanic community in Europe and Latin America. So aside from the deployment that they have in Spain, they have created a model that is now being deployed in more than 14 countries that are now uh, flattened the curve maps of Frena La Curva maps in Portugal, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Chile, Mexico, Uruguay, Bolivia, Argentina, Colombia, France, Peru, Venezuela, Guatemala, Germany, Poland and Brazil. So these are all people who are using the same model that has been deployed in Spain and now creating maps of their own to then connect people with resources that they need um, during this critical time. Next slide. 
In the UK, we're seeing a group of volunteers uh, collecting a database of suppliers and useful resources to support timely procurement of personal protective equipment across all key worker sectors, whether that's hospital or people working in delivery services, in hopes that this data will support government efforts by filling some of the informational gaps. Now let's move closer to home here in Africa. Next slide. Liquid Telecom is collecting and analyzing data to support the Kenya Private Sector Alliance by providing insights on the social and economic impact of the pandemic in Africa. They've seen over 4,000 surveys completed in 15 countries in the last month. They've been able to gather some interesting data. Uh, some examples of these include that 18% of the respondents um, of this map believe that their governments have instituted support measures for SMEs, but they don't know how to access that support. And another 48% are certain that there is no support available from the government at all. Um, another interesting insight is that 25% of the people who responded to the surveys um, said that their home spaces are not conducive for them to work from home. About 30% of this group are resorting to using personal email accounts to do their work for their employers. Of course, this presents a major, a major um, risk on the cybersecurity and data protection side, both for the private sector and government employers. So you can see that they're really trying to collect insights that will then inform you know, whether it's policy or different activities that um, um, businesses can then uh, pursue. Next slide. Map Kibera in Kenya are also using Ushahidi in part to simply document the crisis itself um, and to also create a geospatial information resource about what is happening where in Kenya for anyone in the country to use. Next slide. Aside from the Ushahidi platform, which we built, we also took time as you know, the Ushahidi team and the family to think about some of the other issues surrounding the COVID-19 response, you know, issues around how to get access to the right data um, or tackling fake news. And you know, members of our team then came together along with uh, members of Ushahidi alumni and recently launched an application called Mahala which is uh, meant to be a simple community site creation tool that carries all information that is needed by people in a neighborhood in one place so that you're not struggling to find information from a dozen different websites. It's you know, essentially serving as a trusted place where that communicates what is going on in real time um, and also surfaces what local community resources are available. This application is currently in beta and we're working very closely with our users to figure out how to improve the tool and see how it can augment some of the activities that are already ongoing with other crowdsourcing tools such as ours. Next slide. Now, What's catalyzed this uptake of the platform in the last month? Um, I think the portal theory, theory best summarizes this, that it takes an action that directly affects you to go over and beyond to act. Coming out of this crisis will require everyone's collective responsibility. It therefore makes sense that everyone is then trying to find ways to individually contribute to supporting vulnerable communities or vulnerable groups in the communities, as well as to fill informational gaps to support um, our governments. Next slide. In summary, what we are trying to do as Ushahidi is provide a base where people can, can build up on so that they don't have to start from scratch. Um, and you know, we will continue to do that work, whether it is providing the tools available for people and providing even more strategic guidance on how to leverage technology to support their activities. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to some of the engaging questions that we will have after this. Thank you, Angela. Um, very interesting. Um, Ushahidi has been around for a long time. It's served uh, a lot of communities very well in keeping people connected, um, in keeping people informed, and in keeping giving a lot of isolated communities a voice uh, when it comes to various issues, especially where it needs to be uh, voiced out and uh, be heard by the authorities. So uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, um, who's Andrew Waititu. He leads an organization called Operation Safe Hands Kenya, which uh, was uh, is, was put together in response to the COVID-19 crisis. And, um, and it's been an interesting journey to just watch this um, come together over the last couple of weeks. So um, Andrew, I'll let you take it over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Welcome everybody and thanks Angela for setting the stage on um, how uh, I think a lot of uh, 
organizations in Africa are looking to solve their own problems in, in a really unique way. And that kind of sets the, the, the stage for what Safe Hands Kenya is. Uh, so unlike Ushaidi, which has been around for, for some time, uh, Safe Hands Kenya is uh, about exactly one month and uh, five days old. And uh, maybe going to the next slide, uh, was set up to address uh, an issue that I think a lot of people recognized uh, would, would, would probably be a, a, a massive problem for many countries such as Kenya, which is uh, the, the issue of participation in the informal settlements. There, there's actually an article in today's uh, Financial Times on line where I think Bill Gates is quoted as saying that uh, should should COVID-19 have the same uh, you know exponential uh, infection rate that we have seen in other parts of the world if this happens in Africa we have we have a possibility of losing up to 10 million people and and primarily the the reason behind that is is captured on this slide we we have uh, three major problems in these informal settlements uh, the first one being a lack of sanitation options that is running water uh, sewage management uh, an unavoidable physical proximity because these people live in very cramped uh, quarters. Uh, many times you'll find a family uh, sharing a, a, a one room or two room uh, little shack uh, with very little options in terms of, of, of practicing social distancing. And, and the third one, uh, which is, is also a critical one here, is, is the economic fragility of, of these uh, 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 people because they have to live literally on a daily wage. So they must leave the house to go out uh, and practice whatever uh, wage earning activity they do. And in that probably by the time they come home will be exposing those at home to, uh, uh, to COVID-19. The chart that you see there is uh, a bit scary, but is the reality of the availability of running water in or close to homes in the entire country, including uh, formal settlements. So this kind of paints the picture of, of the reality on the ground. <clears throat> Moving to the next slide, uh, I, I picked on two neighborhoods in which uh, Safe Hands Kenya has already been uh, active in, in providing a basic sanitation products and we'll talk about what Safe Hands Kenya actually does and these are two uh, low-income neighborhoods uh, Kibra and Dandora. Uh, Kibra is uh, estimated to be the largest informal settlement in Africa. Uh, population numbers vary from about uh, 250,000 uh, upwards to uh, even 800,000. Uh, it's it's difficult to to put a finger on that and uh, and for that for the for the main fact that it's also a very a fluid uh, area with a lot of people who live in Kibera moving in and out uh, in search of work. Dandora, on the other hand, is in the north uh, of the city, uh, northeast. And this is the principal dump site uh, for the Nairobi city and uh, is uh, the people who live around and in the dump site, work in the dump site, uh, are exposed to a lot of environmental and waste related hazards. Uh, one of the aspects that we even as Safe Hands Kenya have been trying to look at is the fact that a lot of the PPE material uh, such as uh, face masks, which are not disposed of properly, uh, will end up there and hence also end up uh, infecting or affecting the people who are living out there. You can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Safe Hands Kenya is a coalition of about 30, now 30 companies that came to, together and uh, felt that they, they, with this, we must be able to do something quickly to try and uh, assist the people in these informal settlements. Uh, the first thing that uh, these organizations did is that if they're providing services or products was to suspend uh, the, pro the profit motive. So uh, some of the organizations we have within Safe Hands Kenya uh, provide soap, sanitizer, and uh, surface disinfectant at cost. 
uh, to Safe Hands Kenya uh, for distribution in these neighborhoods. Uh, second was speed. We have been uh, able to relatively quickly uh, organize ourselves and get our response uh, out into the field. And the last one, uh, which is pretty, I believe, pretty unique to this organization uh, was in regards to last mile saturation. How close can you get these products to the actual people who will need them, who will use them? And uh, this is addressed by kind of the unique uh, composition of the organizations that form uh, Safe Hands Kenya. And I'll talk about that in, in the next slide. <clears throat> So in essence, uh, what this uh, organization was put together to do was to initially deliver on that first block that you see there. So around mass sanitation, can we provide soap, hand sanitizer, surface disinfectant and masks to these informal settlements, to all the people in these informal settlements at no cost, at zero cost to them. So they have the... Uh, taking into account that these people will also be heavily impacted uh, from an earning perspective by COVID-19, how can we ease the burden of making the decision between uh, buying a mask or washing your hands and the water involved for that uh, and repurposing that, that money maybe for food that is now becoming even more scarce uh, for them. Other two pillars of this, which are more um, uh, uh, plans for the organization is around sewage extraction. We have partners who are involved in uh, uh, developing uh, very innovative uh, solutions around sewage extraction uh, and water supply within these communities. You can go to the next slide, please. The fourth pillar, uh, which is uh, obviously very uh, critical to success of such a project, uh, you will see and probably have seen a lot of people uh, with all good intentions reacting to uh, the situation in these informal settlements and really across the country and in many countries by delivering uh, anything from foodstuff to soap and the rest. But we are also tying uh, to the back of, uh, of, of, our, of our product, so to speak, uh, with a consumer behavior uh, campaign to help change how people uh, deal with, with sanitation, uh, how they operate uh, amongst themselves, taking into account the fact or the realities uh, of the situation that they live in. So, uh, the first thing that we're obviously trying to do is give them access to this product. Uh, secondly, uh, ensuring that through our campaigns, we are educating them on the importance of effective uh, uh, hygiene and the usage and proper usage of things like masks and disposal of the same if they're going to throw them away. And lastly, we are also including uh, a user experience team uh, to take into account how these products are actually being consumed on the ground. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, providing free product does not necessarily mean that they will actually be used. So trying to ensure that we are addressing things like the positioning of this product. So for example, in the case of hand sanitizer, instead of just you know giving it away and, and people uh, storing it at home, uh, some of them may be most at risk you know, using uh, public transport. So how do we ensure that the public transport vehicles have hand sanitizer all the time and available for the uh, passengers to use? We can go to the next slide. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we are, we are taking a, a relatively unique approach to, to a unique problem. And the first thing is that we are using uh, a lot of data uh, to, to determine uh, the areas of prioritization. <clears throat> so using uh, the data that we have uh, both in, in public and in, in private hands, we're able to create a heat map uh, with weighted uh, indices which include things like the economic security index, uh, population density, share of informal employment, uh, availability or access to latrines and water. Uh, 
as a permanent uh, where these people live. And, and using that, we are able to systematically... Hello, Andrew, we seem to have lost your connection a bit. Um... But 10 Hello, million Andrew. people in total. And, and, yes. and Andrew, we, we lost you for about 30 seconds. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you. So if you go back okay. to where you're yeah. talking about the various indices, yeah, just pick it up from there. Yes, okay. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, what I mentioned is that we are, we are using uh, a data driven approach to address two things. The first is prioritization of uh, the neighborhoods in which we will, uh, you know, try and uh, address this problem. And the, the indices include economic security, population density, uh, formal employment, uh, access to, to running water and, and uh, toilets, and the structure, whether the, the, the home structure is, is permanent or not. And that way we are able to, uh, you know, start in the neighborhoods where there is the highest uh, risk, so to speak. Uh, our plan is to uh, address a population of about 10 million people who live in all informal settlements across the country. Secondly, and you'll see uh, what is probably not a very clear picture, uh, but on the bottom uh, left of that screen, you'll see dots. And this is uh, a fully visible to us uh coverage of our distribution network so the, the the partners that we have actually work many of them work in these informal settlements either providing uh, food or other services products and services and have geo mapped each and every one of their retail points or, or partners that they work with so we can easily so for example if we say in uh Laini Saba, uh, as, 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 as one of the neighborhoods, how many uh, outlets do we have there? So we say we have, uh, you know, 38 outlets, how much soap do we need to get there? How much sanitizer? As that way we are able to manage the distribution of the same in also a safe way so that we are not creating a risk for the population that's coming uh, and maybe overcrowding to try and pick up these items. We can, we can move to the next slide. So I'll, I'll jump through the next three slides pretty quickly, but this is the backdrop of the, the messaging, the change of uh, ch behavioral change messaging that we have been using uh, across the board. It, uh, it, it anchors around the Tiba Nisisi, which means we are the cure in, in uh, Swahili. So hashtag Tiba Nisisi, we are, we, are, we are using that for all our messaging and also Tiba Nimimi, which is I am the cure. So my behavior, because right now as COVID, uh, for COVID, we don't have any known cures for it, but I can change its spread by, by changing my behavior. So we are on uh, newspapers and billboards, radio. We are doing a lot of stuff on social media as well to try and drive this message. We can just flip through the next uh, slide. Uh, you can see some of that material there. Uh, maybe important to note here, we are also, uh, just go up one, please. Uh, yeah, we are, we are also using, uh, you know, do it do and, DIY and, and, uh, type solutions, so recording videos of people able to create masks so that not, uh, they can also make their own. Yeah. And we, we lost you for another 15 seconds. So just go back to the beginning of this slide, please, if you don't mind. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Our network is probably misbehaving uh, here in the office. We have some uh, couple of power outages. Uh, but I was basically saying that what we are doing here is around this messaging, we're also creating a lot of DIY content. So around things like creating your own hand washing stations, uh, people being able to create their own masks for those who we haven't reached to. So there's a lot of content that we are creating behind and uh, uh, anchored on this I am the cure uh, messaging. You can go to the next slide. 
and I'm sure I'm, I'm aware we are also running out of time. Uh, the next slide uh, just shows some of the work that we have done in the course of this week. This is in Dandora. Uh, and this now talks about some of the work that we have already uh, done. We are also testing, and that's important. We are testing uh, some of the theory around how we can get this product to be used. So we are doing large scale piloting, even as we get this product out. That will hopefully that will help us define uh, what our our product looks like at scale, and we are using the month of May to scale out into the entire uh, population, informal population, in Nairobi, which is about 2.7 uh, million people. You can go to the next slide. I think uh, that's probably. Uh, close to it. So a, a few of the learnings that we have had here, obviously, it's a changing regulatory landscape. Governments and uh, uh, other authorities are, are learning also as they go along and, you know, things keep changing, whether it's curfews, uh, ensuring that our people can move and get product where it's supposed to go. Uh, inputs are scarce, uh, as you can imagine, with a, with a global pandemic such as this. Uh, certain inputs are in demand across the world, for example, for, for sanitizer, uh, for disinfectant, things like chlorine uh, in short supply. Uh, there are multiple efforts happening across the country. Uh, and like I mentioned before, all of them have good goodwill behind them. So how can we even a safe hands plug in? There are a lot of people, for example, who have donated hand washing stations. Uh, we are now mapping them. Those hand washing stations, they are not ours, but we are mapping them digitally so that we can supply those with soap. Uh, because the soap is available. And lastly, uh, I think this is uh, another key learning, you know, uh, move fast, be agile, uh, be able to, to, to shift with, with, uh, with changing goalposts, so, so to speak. And I think that brings me to the end of the, the, the slide deck. Thank you very much. So just, just a quick picture of the different companies who, who form uh, uh, Safe Hands Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew and, and Angela. I think I think that was a very, uh, very insightful presentation from both of you. Um, and uh, 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 for the audience, this is a time for you to please uh, send in your questions through the questions tab uh, on your screen uh, and we'll pick it up from there. And I'll try and share as many questions as I possibly can uh, with the with the speakers. But, but for, for, for um, Angela, let's start off with you, first of all. Um, how does Ushahidi ensure data integrity? Because there is there's many sources of data that you use and a lot of it are self crowdsourced how do you ensure data integrity that's a that's a very very good question and something that we we generally you know always get you know the, especially when you're dealing with um platforms that are allowing for data collection from you know from the public there's always a risk of you know either there being inaccuracies um and things like that so some of the things that we set in place within the platform is one nothing goes live on the map until it's gone through you know, some, somebody has gone through to ascertain its veracity and whether it fits into the context of the project that is being is being set up. Um, but typically, aside from that, it what we advise people to do is, you know, work through different partnerships to set up a verification mechanism. So it's a mix of both the technical side, but also the human side, right? So making sure that you have very intricate process of, of identifying where you get the data coming in from and how you verify it whether it is working with people on the ground to co corroborate the information or also pairing up and checking if there are you know multiple messages of the same kind um, kind of coming in so verification mechanisms will vary from project to project but it will be a mix of some of the measures on the platform to ensure that nothing is going live until you've uh, ascertained its veracity but also um for your own individual projects, um, your own verification mechanisms as well that rely on human human aspects. Thank you, um, uh, and, I, and I think that, that that becomes a big issue when it comes to people relying on your data and the credibility of your data. Um, uh, and, and you know, one of the biggest things I think in line with your with your kind of theme of Tibani Mimi or Tibani Sisi, which is um, you know the Q is us or the Q is me. What's what's your sense of the response from the people you've worked with in informal settlements? Because these are arguably 
um, some of the most challenging places in Africa. Um, every African city has an informal settlement or a slum. And in terms of risk, these are some of the areas that we think will be the highest risk when it comes to controlling and preventing uh, COVID-19. What's been your observation about the response from the people in terms of compliance and uh, response to that uh, ask to be responsible for their own well-being and health? So it's, it's, it's been a, a very interesting uh, learning for us. I think first and foremost is to, to share that uh, it, it, the, the, the messaging has been accepted widely. They realize that they must do something you know, to, to try and change their circumstance, uh, even as much as that they, 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 they cannot change the environment. So, uh, for example, uh, when we are uh, doing hand washing stations and uh, uh, surface uh, disinfecting public uh, areas in Dandora this week, we were actually being invited to set these up, for example, at the entrance of, of courts, they, they call them plots here, which, which has a number of, of houses uh, within that. And they were, you, you'd find that even as you, you put up the hand washing station, even before you bring the soap, they have already supplied their own soap. And everybody who's coming in and out has to wash their hands. Uh, so there's been a lot of very positive uh, uptake of the messaging. Uh, a lot of people are, are, wearing, uh, are wearing masks. And some of them are not wearing them properly or the masks are not you know well designed overused and that kind of thing we have seen a huge demand for masks and that is probably also driven by the fact that uh, you know the, the the government has made it illegal to walk around in public areas without a mask so that's a uh, you know a driver of that but there's a huge demand for that if if it was something that uh, people would be uh, you know kind of taking uh, in a, uh, in a, a lackadaisical fashion, it is definitely not the case. So as much as they cannot change their, their living environment, they are doing something about it with the little that they have. Fantastic. And, and, and um, Angela, when, when it comes to, to, to your kind of look at the trend around um, uh, COVID-19 related um, activity on your platform, is there a certain pattern? Is there a concentration in terms of kind of some of kind of you know what 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 themes are there themes emerging from what you're seeing uh, coming through COVID specifically COVID nineteen related um, uh, activity on your platform? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, it's at the very beginning we were really at a loss of you know what exactly would we you know would the platform be used for? But the major theme that's really coming out is this idea of collective responsibility and collective intelligence. So the main one seems to be around connecting um, vulnerable groups or high risk populations with resources that they need. A vast majority of the 500 deployments that we're seeing now is actually matching resources with matching, um, you know, matching resources with matching needs. That's been the major one. Um, even as we, you know, even as we move towards flattening, you know, a flattening the curve, that seems to be the major one. But I think in general, when you look at all of them, it's communities self-organizing and trying to figure out how to support in the situation and fill informational gaps. Thank you, Angela. Andrew, there's a question here about um, data collection. How are you collecting data as CFANS? I, I, I see you've got some pretty rich data points um, and you've mapped it fairly well. How, how, how are you collecting data? So uh, one of the first things that we had to do was sign uh, MOUs and, and agreements with the partner uh, organizations that form safe hands. A lot of this data is proprietary, is, is, is proprietary to those organizations. So we, we had to agree, obviously, to, to keep that data securely. And because some of these organizations actually compete with each other, you know, create uh, Chinese walls between the data so that uh, it, it's not shared across. Uh, but our Safe Hands Kenya, which is literally just a, a project office uh, to deliver uh, this, uh, we, we kind of uh, hold fort around that data and any data that we collect uh, around this program. So uh, many of the points will not, uh, for example, distribution points may not be shared across 
uh, the partners, but information that we collect as Safe Hands Kenya going forward, uh, we can share with the entire coalition. And some of it, some of it is, is, is quite interesting uh, because, for example, now we are collecting, uh, we are geomapping all uh, public hand washing stations which have been donated uh, or put up by different uh, groupings. And that data now will, will kind of, you know, we, we are safe hands, we'll, we'll, we'll have it. And we can use that to drive anything in the future uh, as, as a coalition. Okay, and, and tied to that, another question for you, Andrew, is, is you know, you speak about um, human-centered design thinking um, that uh, kind of informed your choices of some of the stuff and interventions you've created. Uh, how did you involve representatives from the community in designing the products and user experience? So in two ways. Uh, one is with the actual users. Uh, so uh, I'd mentioned one of the first places that we went to was in Kibera. And in Kibera, we worked with two uh, organizations uh, or two sets of, of, of end users. One is an organization called Shofco, which is an NGO working in Kibera. And with Shofco, we went literally door to door distributing some of these products. So we, we had some learnings around the, the, possible, uh, the possibility of doing door to door distribution, which uh, is, is probably in, is, is not going to form part of our, our distribution plan going forward because of different uh, issues. But then we we're also able to speak to the actual uh, end users, the, the the people living in these informal settlements, try and gather information around, you know, how much soap they need, how much soap they actually have, uh, which, like I'd mentioned, it, it seems right now there's an oversupply of soap. Uh, it's not it's not that there's a shortage of of soap. It's more around its use in public areas, and it's. Uh, more frequent use even in the homes. So that then now fed our messaging, uh, which is around the, the behavioral messaging, and that is what we have been driving now. So we are doing a couple of things. One is working with uh, 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 the community uh, groups. So we have like Shofco, we have Dandora Transformation League and others. And then we have people on the ground actually doing things like secret shopping, uh, questionnaires with, with actual users, and then that is all feeding back into what it is that we are doing. So it's a very quick uh, turnaround. We are literally doing our, our pilots learning and revision within a week. So, so that's good to hear because I think at this point in time where it's all about emergency response. Uh, speed is everything, uh, and you know as much as you can fail forward and learn quickly. And uh, yeah, it's it's good to see that. But also very encouraging to see that you you're respecting the local and existing players who've been who've been active in those uh, informal settlements for a long time. I think one of the risks we run through this process is um, believing that we can come in and and uh, apply solutions and overlook existing partners who've been running programs in these communities for a long time. Uh, so so that's, that's great to see. Angela, for you, in terms mm -hmm. of the data you collect, especially around the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis, how much of this is actually being requested or getting to uh, the authorities, you know, the, the decision makers, whether they're municipal um, uh, governments or the governments or the Ministry of Health or whatever, do you get to collaborate or share some of your data with that level of authority who can influence much more macro level uh, decisions? Yes, so to also provide some clarity on how exactly you work. So what, what we do as Shahidi is develop the framework and the tools that people can then um, you know download and host or create their own individual projects, right? So for a vast, for all the deployments that are out there right now for COVID-19, we are not actively the one, we are not the ones actively managing the data incoming in all of them. They're actually being run by non-Ushahidi staff members. This is all being either community organized or by different governments uh, making use of them. Now, for most of the ones that we have seen as notable examples, for example, Pranala Kuva, some of them actually do have some strong partnerships um, established with governments to help fill some of those informational gaps. Um, like the one I mentioned in the, you know, in the UK, Frontline, Frontline Life. They've actually, 
you know, created that database and they then forward that over to, to the authorities. Um, I think in general, looking at how um, success factors for Ushahidi deployments in general, even beyond this crisis, partnerships tend to be really key because it's, it's important to not only surface the information, but close out the feedback loop such that there's action being taken on top of the on top of the data that's being the data that's being received because at the end of the day yes i shared information about a a particular need but then did did that actually elicit a particular response so in short in summary yes um i'd probably need to go in and do a little bit more research on each of these individual uh, deployments but a number of them are actually working in partnership with governments. Um, we've also noticed that there are a couple of governments, like for example, the Abia and Plateau state in Nigeria, who are making use of the platform by themselves to also try and fill some of their informational gaps. Okay, that's good to see because it's, it's very important, I think, in this point in time that uh, uh, governments uh, are able to tap into some of these uh, platforms that are giving them as much information as possible to be able to make as informed decisions as they possibly can. And to, to both of you, to, to both of you, actually, how are your programs funded? Um, is it public? Is it uh, philanthropic funding? Is it um, you know individual donations? And through this crisis, what's been your experience about the flow of money to your programs, uh, whichever source is coming from? So uh, maybe Andrew, do you want to go first? Sure, sure, Frank. Uh, so we we are primarily fun, funded uh, through uh, philanthropic grants. Uh, Currently, 90% of those are coming from outside Kenya. And uh, I think maybe the, the, the key thing maybe to mention here is that because this is a global problem, we are also seeing a lot of uh, not redirection, but uh, refocusing uh, and maybe a reduced availability. Even people who had made you know, certain commitments to be able to, to fund uh, safe hands uh, by a certain day are now thinking, okay, I've also got demands coming from this uh, other aspect, which is probably even closer to home uh, than sending money, you know, all the way out to Kenya. But uh, overall, there is a lot, there's still a lot of, you know, positivity ar around this, especially if your, your project looks like it has legs to it, that it's well thought through, and that it is not just uh, addressing a short-term uh, issue. So there is there is funds, but literally now you 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 are having to fight a lot more for it. Okay, noted. Yeah, and I, I mean, but I, I think I think what's 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 uh, good about this project as well is a lot of it is seeded by by Kenyans and owned by Kenyans and uh, and seeking external support, which I think. Um, uh, it's important to find a lot of this stuff rooted and grounded by the local people, uh, whether it's Kenyans or other Africans, that we take the lead in in uh, in uh, kind of getting these programs off the off the, off the ground. Um, Angela, on your side. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a bit of a long winded answer and give you some background into how we've we've handled um, uh, revenue generation or fundraising in the past, and you know also looking at it now. So, you know, when we started off, we were fully, you know, fully open source, meaning even for a hosted service, we weren't charging any fees. And that meant that we were largely, a large percentage of the, the, the funds we had uh, in the organization were from grant, grant funding and donor base or philanthropic activities. Um, we did make a small amount from value added services, but then halfway through our 12 year journey, we had to then explore ways of sustaining ourselves. And so we explored a software as a service business model, which then allowed for us to charge a certain fee on our hosted service, um, while still being able to give the platform for free using the, the open source um, or the self-hosted version. Uh, however, that came with its own different challenges. And um, I've primarily come in as executive director since October last year to move us towards a different, a strategic shift that then um, focuses on lowering the barriers of access to our tools, one of them being the price. So as I mentioned before, right now we are not charging anything for our hosted, our hosted service. And what that means is that we are primarily relying on grant funding, um, but also looking at other ways of being able to generate revenue. So through enterprise partnerships and providing our support and expertise um, as a service. 
um, over the last month, I mean, there have been a lot of different, um, you know, lists and different groups that are offering philanthropic support, but it hasn't, you know, much like what Andrew is saying, it hasn't been as easy um, to figure out or rather for, for them to learn. So it's still, it's still a, a, a big challenge. Um, you know, right now, a lot of the work we're doing is pro bono. Um, so, you know, we are relying a lot on trying to apply for different grants and any philanthropic support that people can provide. But it, it has been a challenge. And I think just even generally moving forward, um, it, it's an interesting question for us and for other groups that are working in the social social impact space, how you stay true to your, to your missions while still trying to keep the lights on. Um, that, that's really good. And, and uh, Angela, to, to some of the stuff that is developed for very specific countries, so like an impact tracker for country X or a product uh, for country X, how replicable are they to other countries? Do they and do they need that much uh, customization? Just if, if people come to your platform and they see a certain um, thing that's working really well in one country, how replicable is this across multiple countries? Absolutely. So at least from the technological perspective, it's it's very, you know, the platform is available. You can just sign up and you'll have your your, your map set up for you in a matter of in a matter of seconds or a matter of minutes. Um, when it comes to trying to replicate the same model, for example, what the COVID-19 tracker has done, um, I think the only thing that would need to be done there is then customizing your your different service, right? And this is one of the primary reasons why we've been trying to signal boost and share some of these stories so that other people can learn, right? Like I mentioned before, like uh, the Spanish team, the Fernanda Curva team, have actually created a model that has been replicated in more than 14 countries in the last month, right? And what that has required is for them to set up, you know, this is how we structure our service. This is how you can then take it and apply it in, in your own different country. So at least from the technological perspective, it's very easy and very, very quick uh, to do. Um, but in terms of figuring out what what indices or indicators to use for different contexts then that's probably where the work would would, would come in but you do have the support of uh, our community members who've deployed in the past as well as the ushahidi team we try as much as possible to create extensive documentation on you know to provide guidance on how to get that done and also one-on-one -on -one, um, interactions with our support team to make sure that you can replicate the models okay great and for someone who's listening to this um, in Tanzania, Ghana, Nigeria, um, Egypt, South Africa, and is looking to replicate something similar, um, you know, in response to either a short term crisis like COVID or something more long term, what advice would you have for them? What are the things you think people need to pay attention to? What kind of partners should you, should you bring together? Um, you know, uh, what kind of processes should you put together? Because you seem to have responded and moved forward very, very quickly. And too many times we take too long to, to mobilize collaboration efforts towards certain causes. But this, what can we learn from what you've done? It's an interesting one. And it, 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 it can also be seen as, as a little controversial, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll step out on that limb. You know, having never worked also in the NGO space, I think one of the things that the coalition, first of all, had it going for itself is that, as you had mentioned earlier, these were local organizations and companies or heavily invested in Kenya who felt the need to do something and to do something in, in the right way. Uh, the coalition was very quickly set up. We, we, we have a board that we report to that is made up of some of these members who review our strategy even as we go along. Right now, we are having board meetings every week. Uh, that's how fast things are, are changing or, or moving. But that said, the ultimate goal remains the same. You know, how do we uh, create a, a, a midterm solution, not just to COVID, but to sanitation? And I think having that kind of focus and putting, you know, everybody's efforts towards that is one of the things I think that can be replicated, uh, you know, anywhere in the world. That kind of sense of purpose, yes, it has been brought around by the pandemic, but uh, that said, I think there's different individuals have taken up the rallying call and 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 made it and made it happen it's it's also important to note that we are obviously not operating in a vacuum 
So COVID has also provided the focus of different players, you know, whether it be local and national government, uh, other NGOs, uh, societies and communities that we are operating in, operating with. Uh, so everybody's focus is, is on this. Uh, what I think I would be, uh, you know, kind of wary of is that, you know, what happens when COVID itself is not providing that focus? Are we able to continue with this kind of single-minded uh, vision to do good in, in our societies? So one thing that I'm hoping Safe Hands can do is provide a sort of framework, a blueprint that can be replicated, not just for COVID and not just in Kenya, but for any other emergencies uh, you know, at a global level. Fantastic. Okay, that's that's really good to hear. I, I, I mean, we we know and deliberately at, at AVPA we recognize that um, a, a lot of our problems are bigger than any of us can solve on our own. And collaboration is a way to go going uh, in days to come. We have to tackle big challenges that Africa is facing. Um, I want to really thank my my two speakers and give them like 30 seconds for closing remarks. Um, uh, and before you go, we want to do one more poll. Um, so, so Gail, before our guest speakers do their closing remarks, do you want to run the next poll uh, sure. quickly? Yeah, I'll do that now. Okay. Okay, so the poll is running. We'll just give it a few more seconds. Okay, so about 62% have voted, so I'm just going to close the poll now and show the answers. So, okay. yeah, the answers are in. Interesting. Okay, good. It's good to see that um, uh, there's a big chunk of you already investing in Africa. Uh, for those of you who, who are not investing in Africa or thinking about it, if you want to uh, really shape uh, the global landscape on, on social issues, whether you're moving and targeting SDGs, uh, Africa is a place to be. We, we uh, as I say, um, you know, entrepreneurs and people in our space are problem solvers. If you, uh, we have a set of really interesting problems on this continent and we'll be very welcoming to you uh, to come and um, work with us in solving some of our challenges and AVPA is very willing to be a, a partner for you in, in, this, in this process. So please, uh, we'll share with you our details in a short bit. But as that is happening, uh, Andrew uh, and uh, Angela, Angela, do you want to go first, 30 seconds, just in closing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, um, we are trying as much as possible to surface a lot of the, the I, I only shared a, a, like a, a bit of some of the stories on the presentation today. If you'd like to have a look at some other ones, just visit our website, ushahidi.com slash COVID, that'll give you insights into some of the stories in detail, as well as some deployments. And if you have any questions or would like to talk further about working with us, you can email me at Angela at Ushahidi.com. Thank you all so much for your time. Andrew? Yep, thanks, thanks, Frank. And uh, it's been a pleasure, uh, Angela, sharing a stage with you guys. I think as, as Safe Hands, uh, again, as, as Frank has alluded to, I, th I think we we are kind of the the embodiment of that. We 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 do have uh, the ability to create the solutions for the problems that we have, you know, in in Af in Kenya, in Africa, and possibly across the world. Uh, I would also ask you to to have a, a quick look at uh, safehandskenya.com. Uh, I can also be reached uh, on email Andrew at safehands. Uh, Kenya.com. If you have any other questions or anything else that you may need uh, to 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 get further information on, thank you very much. And, and, and thank you very much. Thank you very much to Angela and Andrew. Um, I think what COVID-19 and the coronavirus infection has shown us is the world is a lot more interconnected uh, than we believe and imagine. I think it's important that we we recognize that uh, we all have a collective role to uh, share solutions, share ideas. And as part of this process, um, AVPS is also running weekly webinars in Africa where we focus entirely on the vulnerable um, and disadvantaged uh, as it relates to COVID-19 and solutions 
um, designed and affecting them. Uh, so we, we we are focused heavily on those, and we we co join we co host those ones with Suncorp. But I wanted to thank everyone for the time they've made to join us today. Uh, the slide that you're seeing now will share my uh, our email addresses for Nancy and myself, and uh, our Twitter addresses, uh, Twitter handles at the mo at the bottom as well. I'm very very grateful for those of you who made time to join us, and please reach out. Uh, we can connect you to our weekly webinars where we continue these kind of conversations heavily focused on Africa and heavily focused on, um, on uh, solutions and practitioners working in that space. Uh, and I think we also are starting to look at a post-COVID world because what COVID is doing is showing and exposing some opportunities for social investors to plug into. And as I mentioned earlier, Africa is a fantastic place for you to get some good returns on your social investments. And we're very happy and willing to, to partner with you. On behalf of EVPA, the speakers, the organizers, and EVPA for hosting us, Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye.